Usually our manager, Jamie Rice Gomes, will be presenting, um, but today you you guys have me. I'm Megan Kay, like I said, the outreach coordinator for the Living With Fire program. Um, as a reminder, I wanna let you guys know that all of the PowerPoints you're gonna see today will be made available after the presentation. We'll, guys, we'll send you guys a follow-up email and we're also going to upload this um, presentation to YouTube. We do have to take, it takes a little bit of time for us because we have to make sure everything's accessible. So we have to make sure that all the presentations are, get remediated um, so that they can be read by screen readers and that we have um, accurate subtitles for the YouTube video. So if you guys don't get those right away, don't worry, you will, you'll, you'll get them eventually. Um, just wanted to do some housekeeping. We are gonna, before we start the presentation, we're gonna do a short poll to kind of gauge your knowledge about the topic. And then afterwards, uh, we'll do another short poll to see what you guys have learned and how you guys are going to implement that knowledge. So if you guys could stick around after the presentations for the polls, that would be lovely. We really appreciate it. It helps us with uh, grant reporting and just improving the quality of our programs. Um, for those of you who may not be Zoom savvy, I know most of us are because of the pandemic, but just to quickly go over the landscape of Zoom, um, on the bottom left, you'll have the mute button. You guys are automatically muted, but during the Q&A, um, if it's appropriate and you guys want to ask a question, we might ask you to unmute yourself. That's how you do it. Um, video, if you want to turn your video on, it's right there. To ask questions, go ahead and open that chat. If you guys will uh, notice, um, if you click on the, the chat button right now, there you can message any of the presenters, but you can also uh, message questions for speakers. So that right now is being manned by Christina Rostano, the director of Living With Fire. So if you guys have any questions during the presentation, go ahead and send them to questions for speakers because um, Brad or Jen might not, while they're presenting, they might not be able to see those. So if you send those to questions for speakers, we'll send them along to Brad and Jen for um, the Q&A session. And that's just what I said. So, <laughs> so when you guys go uh, to your chat, just if, if in case you haven't messaged, messaged specific people, there's a drop down right there and you'll just find questions for speakers and type your question into that. If you wanna change your view at any time, um, if you wanna see the gallery view, go ahead and you can change it up there in the top right-hand corner. Um, otherwise, if you're on speaker view, you'll, you should be seeing the speaker in the presentation. And if at any time you would like to leave the workshop on the bottom right-hand corner, there's the red button and you are more than welcome to do that. You'll still be, um, if you guys need to leave early, you'll still be getting that follow-up email with the presentation and the resources. And if we were doing this presentation in person, um, we would be in a room with this poster. Um, we're required to have, have this information available to everyone in our presentations saying that extension programs are federally funded and our programs are open to anyone. And the USDA contact information is provided here for your convenience. If you guys need that information, you can go ahead and email us at lwf at unr.edu, as well as any information about the topics or wildfire in general. Okay, so right now I'm gonna go ahead and launch our pre-workshop poll. So, a poll should be popping up. Go ahead and participate and fill in your answers, please. And while we're doing the poll, I'm gonna introduce our speakers. Um, first, we're gonna start off with Brad Milam, who's a fire investigator and education specialist, and also fire trespass coordinator with the Bureau of Land Management. Brad has 20 years of, of wildfire experience and has investigated over 250 fires. He conducted investigations that resulted in civil judgments and out-of-court settlements totaling in approximately $520,000 and also 2.5 million are pending. So he has a lot of experience in wildland 
and investigation and his presentation is pretty interesting. I got to have a sneak peek at it. And then after Brad's presentation, we're gonna hear from Jennifer Diamond, who's the forest fire prevention officer with the US Forest Service, Humboldt Toyobi National Forest. She's a wildland fire investigator. She's on the fire prevention team. She has a lot of experience. Um, she is a, has a wealth of knowledge about wildfire, how they begin and ways that you guys can um, avoid sparking those human caused wildfires that we always hear about that cause so much problems, so many problems. Okay, so most of you guys have voted. We have a small but mighty group here. I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and we'll share those results so you guys can kind of get an idea of who you guys are interacting with today. Mostly Nevadans, got some, Cal some folks from California and Oregon, welcome. And mostly folks are homeowners, probably looking out for their, their property, agency staff, land management, political representatives, and other. Welcome. Looks like most people know what a red flag warning is. That is awesome. It's very important to know what that is. Do you understand how a vehicle can start a fire? Most people said yes. I think we'll probably be surprised a little bit too here. And can you name three most common types of human caused fire? We have, it's pretty split. So it looks like we're gonna hopefully be learning a lot about that topic. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and we're gonna get Brad Milam on here. Brad, do you mind starting your video and getting your screen going? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Let's see. Let's see. So before we get started, I just want to say that, um, you know, prevention <clears throat> and fire investigation pretty much go hand in hand. Um, when I start my screen, is it sharing? Yeah, looks looks good. Okay, I'm gonna close the polls. Okay, so studies have shown that um, every dollar spent on fire prevention saves an estimated of $35 on suppression costs. So when you're looking at how fires are starting, um, that's the most important part is figuring out what starts these fires and how to curb your efforts to prevent future fires from happening. Um, a lot of my bosses and things say, is prevention measurable? Um, because if you're not, if a fire doesn't start, did you prevent that or did you not? And I had to say, yes, it's, I believe prevention is measurable. Um, you can look at your 10 year fire history, even your 15 year fire history. And if you see a downward trend, then your prevention efforts are working. And a good example of that is right outside Winnemucca, we have um, a water canyon um, campground area. Um, it's got a nice creek, nice trees, a very popular spot. It's only three miles from Winnemucca. Um, I, when I, before I got here, I looked at our 10 year fire history for that area and we were getting 20 to 25 um, abandoned campfires per year. And I've posted a lot of signs up there that say drowned your campfire. I speak at the high schools. I speak at the middle schools, grade levels. Um, I ac actually go up there on my lunch break and hand out little collapsible pails that they can dip water out of the creek and, and dump it on there. And um, you know, one of the times I was up there, one of the kids was like, dad, you know, this fire is still a little warm. I learned it from school and let's put another bucket of water on it. And it was like, yes. Um, so going from 20 to 25 fires a year, uh, that area now sees an average of two abandoned campfires a year. So is it measurable? Absolutely. And that's a good success story that we have. Um, so going back to it, uh, we need to find out what is starting those fires uh, in order to get our prevention efforts in line with what our problem areas are. So how do we do that? How do you look at a fire and go from a big fire like that down to what actually caused the fire? Um, you can see the matches with the cigarette. Um, this was probably an arson device. Um, as the cigarette burns down, 
time delays, and then it'll start the matches on fire. So we're trying to investigate every single human caused fire that is in our area, and that's our policy. So going to an origin of the fire, it's where the fire first ignites. Um, you have a specific origin area and the actual origin of the fire. So when a fire first starts, it'll burn outward in a circular fashion until it's acted on by an outside force, either wind or terrain is the most um, predominant factors on that. So to understand the anatomy of a fire, you have advancing fire or the head of the fire. And these are gonna have bigger flame lengths and be um, burning a lot hotter. Then you have lateral fire movement where the fire moves sideways and then towards the front. Um, and then you have your backing fire um, where the fire is either burning down slope or against the wind. And you're gonna have a lot smaller flame lengths and a lot less fire intensity and it'll leave different indicators that we look at um, to identify all these transition zones. And this is important um, to identify these transition zones so you know uh, which way to go back towards the origin. So again, advancing fires, more damage, uh, cleaner burn, rapid rate of spread, and the, lat the lateral fire is um, a little lighter burn. Um, and then your backing fire is a very light burn. So as we get into that, this area of where the star is on this slide, you're looking at your general origin area and then your specific origin area, and then eventually get down to your ignition point or what started the fire. So fire burns according to uh, scientific principles. So when we go through every single fire as an investigator, you have to apply the, the scientific methodology. Um, you're looking at every single fire and we'll go through the cause categories and you have to rule out every single um, category in order to find out exactly what started the fire. So if you're looking at this slide again, you can see the charring on the tree. We call this angle of char. It goes up into that motion. So you know the fire direction went from the right side of this screen to the left, just based on the burn patterns. Okay, here's another one of angle of char. Again, you can see the charring from the fire. It, the fire came in low and exits high. So this would be angle of char. Again, this fire was moving from left to right. So you know your origin area is back to the left. Um, different down logs. Um, and you can use just about anything in a fire to uh, um, make a determination on which direction the fire came from. So in this example, the down logs, you have damage on the left side of the log, protection on the right side where it didn't burn. So the fire moved from left to right on this slide. So your origin area would be back to the left. Foliage freeze, this happens with anything with leaves or needles. Um, the foliage freeze as the wind and fire pushes against the, the bush, tree, plant, um, it'll freeze the, the leaves in the direction the fire went. So in this case, the fire went from left to right. So your origin area would be back to the left. And you'll get a lot of these on the roadside fires too. Um, there's a lot of garbage, but you can use any piece of garbage um, as an indicator. So you see in this one, the can is stained on the right side. Um, that happens with smoke and heat. Um, so it, you can see which direction the fire came from. And in one, this one picture, there's a ton of different indicators that they're using um, to determine what the, which direction the fire came from. So in this slide, they determined that the fire went from the bottom right to the top left. Um, here's an example of, of backing fire. And when we're talking about backing fire again, low intensity, um, usually burning against the wind, um, you can see that this cheatgrass um, didn't even burn. So it'll burn the bottom of the stems and then lay over and actually point to which way the, the, the fire came from. Um, if this was in the head of the fire or the advancing fire, obviously it'd be completely consumed. So we know that the origin would be down towards the bottom because this is in the backing fire. Um, pine cones, you can use pine cones. 
Um, here we have a couple different indicators. You can see that the fire direction went from basically the bottom of the screen to the top because of the way the pine cone is burnt. And also the needles are unburnt on the backside. So the fire direction would be going from bottom to top of the screen. You can see those indicators there. Um, you guys can probably already guess, but uh, this would also be a low intensity fire. Um, the charring on the trees is not significant like the first couple slides we saw. So I would say this is definitely a backing fire. And it shows in the blue there um, that the charring on the trees is very low. So that would be a low intensity fire. Um, fire direction is going back. Here's one uh, that shows Advancing fire, um, you've got a couple of different indicators on this. Um, you can see the backs, the right side of the, the branches there are, are protected, um, meaning that it was an advancing fire and the fire was going from left to right. You see the fire direction. Rocks, um, lots of rocks um, are great indicators. You can see the staining on the bottom of the rock, the bottom right corner. Um, again, that's um, from the heat and the smoke and it will change the rock's colors. So you can see and pull it out, take a look behind it. Um, shows a couple different indicators there, but uh, it'll show you the direction that the fire came from. And this is how we track back to the origin on all this stuff so that we can decide, make a determination of what actually caused these fires. Again, here's another example of some staining on a rock, some other indicators there showing the fire direction went that way. Another rock, um, again, you can see the staining, pretty obvious. Advancing fire, fire went that direction. And I'll, happy, I'll be happy to answer any questions um, after this. Uh, so we were looking at damage differential as well. Um, there's a bunch of, um, saplings here that are all the same size, same category. Um, you're talking about the same fuel moisture, um, same size, diameter. So you'd think that the charring would be equal. Um, they're in different locations and you're basing your determination on the amount of damage that it receives. So in this picture, it's blown up a little bit. The wind is blowing this way. Can you identify can you identify a transition zone? Um, so as you can see, there's some saplings on the left side of the screen, and there's hardly any on the right side of the screen. So advancing fire would be from the right side of the screen. You've got some lateral movement on the left side of the screen. So your transition zone would be right there. And anytime an investigator finds um, or sees some of these indicators and they make a determination, they'll put all these flags all over the place. And each flag uh, represents a different indicator. So the blue would be backing fire, yellow would be the lateral, and red would be advancing. And so as we wa are walking around the fire, we're reading these indicators and we're putting all these flags down. And this will show us the direction of spread and make a better determination on what started this fire. Um, wind speed, um, especially in Northern Nevada, uh, winds are a predominant factor on what drives these fires. And this is an example of showing what, what wind speeds do to a, a, a wildfire. So from two and a half miles per hour, you're getting more of a circular fire. Um, and then as you go to 15 miles per hour, it's getting longer and, and narrower. And the X's would represent obviously where the origin was. And this has been studied on multiple levels. Um, they even go up to uh, NWCG courses. This is off the Fire Investigator 210 course, which is an NWCG course. Um, and just all these different sites have the exact same uh, determination on, on wind speeds and what it does to the fire. So 55 mile per hour wind in this example, where would you put the specific area of origin? Right there, if you said right there, you got the right answer. Um, so wind driven fire, 55 mile per hour wind, you can see how narrow it is. So going back to fire cause categories. So as we go to the fire, 
and we're making our determination. We have a bunch of different uh, fire cause categories from lightning, equipment use, campfires, railroad, arson, children, um, campfires, fire use, uh, everything has to be in play. And you have to um, exclude each one of those causes in order to come down to your um, determination. So we covered those. Equipment use um, covers everything from aircraft. Uh, we get uh, a lot of military fires uh, with the, the uh, Fallon Air Force Base and down in the Nellis Air Force Base. And we have the United Testing Range as well. So that would also be in the equipment use category. Again, we were, we'll talk more about children. And miscellaneous. Um, miscellaneous is a lot of fires that um, are kind of out of the ordinary. Uh, you have, uh, I believe fireworks is in that one, firearm use, blasting, um, spontaneous combustion is in there. Uh, if we get a lot of farmers with that bale, some um, moist hay, uh, we'll get some spontaneous combustion um, coming out of that. So as we're going to these fires, again, you're walking around the whole area um, and you're trying to look for evidence, look for signs of what could possibly have started this fire. So firearms and ammunition, um, there'll be targets in the area. There'll be a lot of shells in the area. Um, you'll see a lot of evidence of, of shooting in that area, um, especially when people start fires, they normally don't pick up all their brass and all of their targets. Um, and if it's a known shooting area, then um, you have a better idea of what the determination could be. Oxygen and selling, um, cutting near the origin of the fire, there'll be fresh um, samples of that. Uh, you know that if there is some rust on it, then it's probably not fresh, um, but there'll be definitely evidence of, of that cause. Same thing with welding. You'll see the welding slag, you'll see, see the welding rods. Uh, they don't they don't clean them so they don't clean up uh, before they leave the scene. Fireworks is another one. Um, you can actually get down to the exact piece of paper that started the fire um, in the actual origin area, but you'll also see the the tubes somewhere near the area where they were shooting those cannons off. Um, they don't pick those up usually when they when they start a fire and they try to leave. Um, power lines. There's a multiple reasons that a power line would start a fire want to be power failure um, nests bird nests and power lines trees falling on power lines um, and then the, the uh, power company usually will come out there and try to remove that um, before trying to repair their lines before the investigators get there um, and they want to try to restore power as soon as possible but uh, but if they do, they'll absolutely, they'll actually leave that on the ground and you'll be able to make that determination. Blown fuses. Uh, there's a lot of blown fuses, uh, any power surge. Um, these tubes are actually in the um, fuse pole itself and they actually have a metal um, wire that goes through these tubes. And when a fuse blows, you see the rod on the right bottom right corner that metal um, line that's in those fuses will actually completely melt and it'll drip down the bottom of that fuse line. Um, that's a failure and um, sometimes that hot metal slag will drop on the ground. Children, um, children do start fires. Uh, a lot of kids get together, show off. Um, sometimes these can lead to um, uncontrolled wildfires. And in fact, there was one in Oregon um, that a uh, underage juvenile um, started a fire with the fireworks. And uh, I believe the suppression costs were $37 million. And the court ruled that uh, the family was on the hook for that 37 million. And so they're not trying to financially ruin anybody. Um, I believe they worked out a deal where the, the kid has to pay $100 a month until he's 18. And if they miss a payment, then um, they're on the hook for the whole amount. So that'll, you know, kind of still give a punishment to the, to the child um, while, while still not financially ruining them. 
so, but also kids would leave um, evidence in the origin. Uh, you can see they have a lot of stuff. If they started a fire, they'd probably leave the area. They'll probably leave toys, um, but they'll, they'll definitely leave evidence um, that they were there. And in Northern Nevada, it's kind of easy to rule this one out. Um, a lot of our fires in the middle of nowhere, there's no way a child could be out there. But when the ch child starts uh, fires out of curiosity or more pathological reasons, they do have a um, youth fire setter programs um, set up in a lot of places that uh, will actually counsel um, kids from stopping or starting fires. Um, <clears throat> equipment use, uh, this covers lawnmowers as well. Um, if a lawnmower runs over a rock or a tractor or some other equipment, they'll leave a rock strike. And you can see the rock strike right there in that fire um, at, on this example. And it actually split this rock in half. So you'll be able to see this evidence um, in, in the fire area. Uh, burn barrels, this would go into fire use. Um, a lot of people that have burn barrels that start fires most of them say that the fire started from somewhere else and dropped embers in my burn barrel. Um, well, as you can tell, um, you can look at all those indicators and prove that the fire came from their burn barrel. Railroads, uh, railroads do start fires. You can see in this example, this is a catastrophic failure. Um, a lot of them are le less subtle. Um, exhaust particles, uh, brake shoe particles, um, but railroads do start fires quite a bit. And I'll show you here um, in my example. Um, this is a uh, locomotive that has a failure with its uh, exhaust. And I'll show you if I can play this video. So you can see in the infrared camera, the exhaust particles being blown out um, from failure and then you can see them landing in the grass. And a lot of times you'll see they'll just keep fires going with them. Um, it's not uncommon that um, a locomotive like this would start multiple fires um, for a long distance. Okay, also uh, locomotives are they're metal on metal. Um, so when the wheels slip, um, they leave a little residue, uh, but they will, this, this will get hot enough to start fires um, and happens quite often. Uh, they do that for either being overloaded or going around corners too fast and having to hit their brakes, um, but these do cause fires. Here's an example of a major wheel slip. Um, so this train was severely overloaded and um, as it's trying to go, it just grinds itself down onto the tracks. And here you have the brakes, again, metal on metal. Um, and the brakes are no different. They do have brake shoes. Um, sometimes those fail, but they do shoot sparks out. And equipment use. Um, Nevada is, is heavy, heavy, heavy on um, roadside fires. Uh, we have cheat grass that go right up to the highway. We're trying our best to remove those fuels, mow, create uh, fuel brakes. But um, just about everything that comes off of a vehicle is extremely hot and starts fires. Uh, it doesn't really matter on what time of the year. Um, something comes off of a vehicle at 10,000 degrees, it, it'll start a fire. Um, so we have exhaust particles, catalytic converter particles, um, and it's just extremely common in Nevada. And here's another example of a roadside fire. <clears throat> and a number of different things could happen. It could be, <clears throat> excuse me, a piece of a brake, um, catalytic converter, uh, flat tire, people have blowouts and they have the rumble strips that keep people awake um, and keep you on the road. Sometimes when you have a blowout, um, the rim will actually bounce off of those rumble strips and shoot sparks in there. Um, trailers, chains, uh, we've had people that um, don't have the right size ball for the trailer. And so when that when they hit a bump, it pops off and then they'll drag those chains and trailer until it, it fails. So we're looking at exhaust particles from a gasoline vehicle are a lot smaller than diesel. Um, 
either diesel pickups or semi trucks. Um, they're shiny or dull and they're not magnetic. Um, I haven't found any that have been um, magnetic, but uh, when the investigator goes through, we will actually find those little particles that are smaller than a dime and um, make our determination. And you'll have the indicators that, that show right up to it. Um, here is some exhaust particles from a semi or a diesel truck. Um, again, those particles are a lot bigger, some of them more than an inch in diameter. Um, but you'll see that you'll sm you can smell them. Um, they smell like exhaust and they fall apart in your hands, but they'll be sitting right in the origin area of the fire. And that's typically happens on, um, on roads or highways with a high grade or a um, corner. Um, catalytic converter pieces, you don't see too many of the ceramic beads on the bottom right. Those are for older vehicles. They don't um, make those anymore. Um, but the honeycomb monolith on the bottom left, that is all part of your catalytic converter. And when a catalytic converter fails, um, it'll break into a lot of different pieces and they get extremely hot, again, five to 10,000 degrees. And as you hit the gas, it's blowing pieces out um, all over the place, uh, up to 30 feet away from the road. So this is what a typical catalytic converter piece would look like in a fire. Um, note that this one was from um, a set of five fires. So probably a lots of different uh, catalytic converter pieces. Some are smaller than your, your pinky nail and some are as big as your fist. Um, just depends on um, how bad your catalytic converter has failed. But if you can see, you can see some of the indicators in there. You've got some grass stems falling down um, on the left side there uh, that would show backing and then not a lot of the grass stems on the right side, which would show advancing. So there's your little catalytic converter piece in this fire. Incendiary, not as common. Um, this is typically arson. Um, a hot set would be somebody just uh, using a lighter and taking it with them. Um, they're difficult to identify. Uh, there's no evidence in the area. Um, if they have matchbooks, you can see the cigarette matchbook device. Again, that's a time delay device. Uh, if those are completely consumed in a fire, again, the fire investigator would go through and um, come over it with a magnet and you'll actually be able to find a staple in the, the matchbook. So if there's a fire up in the middle of nowhere, why would um, a staple be there? Um, there was probably a matchbook in that area. Um, so let's take a little practical exercise. Uh, so as an investigator, like I said, you're showing up to the fire, you're, you're looking in the area, usually trying to find people coming in or out, um, taking mental notes of what you see to try to make a better determination on what started the fire. So if you want to take a second, go through this exercise and just try to think about everything you can observe and what you can remember. Okay, it's tough to do um, without a classroom, but uh, or in person. But um, how many people uh, saw two witnesses or suspects? And you guys feel free to use the the reactions down there. You can raise your hand. So. Um. So it's important to see that you, there was two people standing on the side of the road. Um, what they were wearing, uh, one had a red shirt, one was male, one was female. Um, both one the males wearing long sleeves, um, short haircut, hairstyles, sunglasses, everything you can remember um, because these people may have started the fire or they may have seen somebody start the fire. So they could be a witness or a suspect. Did anybody get the license plate number of the truck? At least the state um, would be a good start. 
how about the truck? It's an older Ford, uh, gray in color, rusty hood. Um, and I think I cheated a little bit, but I, I see that they have Kelly tires. Um, we'd also see if the tire impressions. If this was something that started on the side of the road, um, were there tire tracks that came off the road and went right to it, um, then you'd be able to put tire impressions and put that vehicle at the center of the incident. Um, the truck bed rack, um, out of the ordinary, for sure. Uh, you don't see too many like that. So that'd be a good thing to describe um, to other law enforcement to say, hey, be on the lookout for a truck with this type of um, a rack on the back. It's not a very common storage rack. And the individual driver. You know, he's wearing a hat, sunglasses, white shirt, older, maybe in his 50s. Um, so you can definitely see that it all happens all at once. And you definitely want to take as much observation as you possibly can. So we're going to get to a fire that happened on the Winnemucca district. Uh, this is the rodeo fire. Happened about three years ago. Uh, it burned um, two properties down. And when I showed up, um, first of all, the, the homeowner did not want me on his property. Um, there was a jurisdictional issue, uh, whereas I'm a BLM employee, why am I out on private property investigating a fire? Well, if a fire burns any amount of BLM land, um, I have the authority to um, go in and make an or uh, uh, investigate the fire and do a, um, an origin and cause report for it. Um, so a little more background on this one. I, again, didn't want me there. Uh, both neighbors were fighting, uh, blaming that each other that they eat, that one started the fire. No, my neighbor started the fire. No, he did it. No, he did it. Um, so it's important to go through uh, all of our indicators and make a determination um, because that would be horrible if my neighbor um, or your neighbor um, blamed you for starting a fire. Um, and now we, you know how we go through each and every fire and uh, make our determination. We can track that back and we can find the truth. So lots of stuff in here, um, uh, lots of junk, but again, you can use all that junk as indicators. Uh, every single piece of this would have staining or sooting or protection. So I can use all this stuff um, to, use, to find the direction the fire came from. Here's another example, um, lots of stuff in there. Um, tough to find. You know, again, you have equipment in there, you have ATVs, UTVs. Um, what started this fire? Another picture. Lots of rims. Um, everything had a fire indicator on it. So this was actually good to have all this stuff in here. But again, going through your origin and cause report, you have to exclude every single um, item. Um, so lightning, I had to pull uh, 72 hours of lightning data and make just show that that did not start the fire. Um, smoking, uh, campfire, kids, you know, there's no railroad in the area and no power lines. So again, you're starting to check off some of these cost categories of what the what could not have started the fire. And from what you guys have learned through this presentation so far, I hope you can see that the fire in this picture move from right to left. Um, that gas can is charred on the right side and not so much on the left. Um, again, we're using a lot of the stuff in this area as indicators. Uh, even sagebrush will do the foliage freeze. Um, as we saw in the previous slides, um, sagebrush does the same thing. So the fire is going from right to left on this slide, and you can see all the sage is frozen towards the left side. So as I'm getting closer and closer and nailing, um, narrowing down, what could have possibly started this fire? Again, here's another um, can, looks like antifreeze coolant, um, but the fire is charred on the right or the jug is charred on the right side and not so much on the left. Uh, you can see that the fire went from the right side of the screen to the left. Uh, so we're just narrowing down what could have possibly started this fire. And then we get to um, this area. Um, you can see one, two, three, four, five lawnmowers. So I have to rule out, um, was it a mowing rock strike? Um, things like that. So going through here, um, you gotta look at the indicators. 
where they're leading you. Can you rule out mowing? In this case, I could. Uh, apparently, none of these uh, lawnmowers worked. He was just a repairman of some sort, but there was no um, rocks in the area, um, no strike marks. But there is something in this picture that um, you can notice too, is the truck that's parked on the left side of the screen. And you can see that drag mark going from the front of the truck all the way up to past the yellow tape um, in, in this the black area. And that truck, the back end of it, um, back driver's side, um, the taillight was melted down and the truck was actually in that fire. Um, the landowner um, didn't want it to completely consume. So he hooked it up and drug it out um, with that fire going. And so what does that tell you as far as an indicator? The fire came from the back of that truck and it was parked in the fire area. So I know that um, that's my white Jeep in the center, that the fire actually started um, that closer to where that the Jeep is parked. And if you look, um, this little uh, horse trough feeder um, was full of debris. And after we, I narrowed down um, what, could, what started the fire, we re-questioned the landowner who did admit that um, they actually had a bunch of trash in there and they lit that on fire and, and left. And as you can see, it was um, the, the trough is on the other side of the fence. So that actually, the other side of the fence is BLM land. So this is a, a technically a BLM fire because he started on BLM land. So there again, um, the jurisdictional issue um, was mitigated because the fire actually started on um, BLM. And you can see that it didn't back too much. Uh, there wasn't very much backing in this at all. Uh, the grass is pretty green. The shrub is green and it's really mowed down. It really didn't move um, back where I was parked. Um, the dead grass didn't really start until it hit the um, owner's property. So when we have fires like this, um, we determine um, if there's negligence, uh, if there's liability. And what we do for fire, some of these fires is we pursue cost recovery and we'll actually charge on the people with the fire. Um, this one was about $4,000 and his homeowner's insurance policy covered it because of all the damage um, that was done to his property and, and the neighbor's property. Uh, but homeowner's insurance would cover renter's insurance and um, vehicle insurance as well. I mean, we understand that a lot of times there are accidents. Um, we don't pursue cost recovery on everything. But if, for example, you had a flat tire and you drove on it for 15 miles until it was on the rim and kept going on it and started multiple fires and, and um, then we would pursue property damage um, on your insurance. Um, so we don't try to, again, financially hurt anybody, but um, cost recovery is a deterrent uh, that we use and all of that money gets put back into the prevention program. Uh, we had to spend every single dollar um, and it's mandated on how we can spend it. Um, back into the prevention. So was this fire preventable? Absolutely. Uh, I think most human caused fires are preventable. Um, and so with this $4,000 that we collected from this fire, um, we put out some messaging. Um, use a proper burn barrel, a proper screen cover. Don't leave unattended fires, have water and a shovel ready. Um, you could message um, that the dump or local landfill is free and um, we could put the radio ads out with this, this these funds and, and say, hey, you know, Winnemucca landfill is free. Um, don't burn your trash, uh, take it to the dump. Uh, it might be a safer option. Um, I know um, Clark County, it's free um, down in Vegas. If you have a current bill, then the landfill is free. If it's not free, then um, part of the prevention efforts would be to work out a deal with the dump or landfill and have a two week window free for yard waste and see if they would work with you and work with the community and say, hey, um, for this, these two weeks, uh, yard waste dumping is free. And not only that, but maybe it would stop citizens from burning, but it could also prompt them to make defensible space where they wouldn't normally do it. Um, but working with your cooperators and advertise, 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 uh, you can't get enough 
advertising. I know uh, down in the Carson City, Reno area, they have like Jump the Juniper events, things like that, that um, try to get some more resilient landscaping in their yards. Or in an extreme measure, um, you can work with the county and issue a burn ban um, so that uh, people would stop burning debris. Uh, we do that quite a bit. Uh, we go into fire restrictions and burn bans um, quite often. Uh, if we have problems with escape burns or um, things like that, we would go into it a little bit earlier than normal. So going back to it, um, again, with all the cost recovery, we spend it back in the prevention program. Um, for every dollar spent on prevention, saves an estimate $35 on suppression costs. Uh, you know, as fires are getting um, much bigger and more costly, I mean, some of these fires are over $100 million or more to fight. So if we can prevent, you know, one or two of these fires from happening, getting very large, then um, we're doing uh, our job. But in order to do that, we have to investigate the fires determine what caused them and see if we have a trend and then start curbing a prevention effort around that trend. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. That's a really good segue into our next speaker, Jen Diamond. I have a lot of questions for you, but I'm gonna wait till the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, I know I kind of blew through that. That's actually a, <laughs> a, a week long course um, that we teach and I trying to, get it done in 30 minutes. <laughs> you did get, you did a good job. <laughs> so uh, yes, yeah, so this is Jen Diamond. I mentioned her earlier. She's the uh, fire a fire prevention officer in the Humboldt Hawaii National Forest. Welcome, Jen. Hey, thanks for having me, Megan. Is my audio okay? Yes. Okay, let me get a screen share up here. here. Okay, are you seeing fire prevention tips there? Yes, looks good. Okay, so yeah, thanks for having me, Megan, and the whole Living with Fire team, and that was really great info, uh, Brad, to, to share there. Pretty um, impressive how we do that scientific methodology. And I think there's an interest there from the public to, to know how we do that. So thanks for sharing. Um, I'm just gonna share some uh, prevention tips and some of those Brad already went over a little bit, but I uh, wanted to just reiterate some of those. So um, I'm sharing here just some of our top human causes in Nevada that, that Brad already went over a little bit, but you know, it's important to know how to prevent those wildfires. Um, and so in order to do that, we've got to know those causes. Um, all fires on public lands are to be investigated. So um, BLM, Forest Service, all federal lands have a policy to investigate all fires. Um, so I'm just going to go over like the top three that we generally see here um, in Nevada. However, um, it's a little bit different for um, each area that you're that you're in in Nevada. Um, it's a little bit based on the time of year, the population, um, and what kinds of activities people are doing um, in those areas. So it can vary from agency to agency and from state to state. Um, so. Brad was speaking to some of those debris burning um, escape fires that uh, he sees out there in his area. Um, and for example, up in the Mount Charleston area, which is in Southern Nevada, and there's mountains up there and lots of camping, that was our top cause um, last year um, based on how many um, recreators and campers that we were seeing in that area. So again, our top causes can can vary and change. Um, Elko might have more equipment related type fires um, and vehicle type fires. Along the Sierra front, we see a lot of target shooting related fires. So, so this statistic can vary, like I'm saying, year to year. Um, and it's also based on the, the grass crop um, and area to area that we have. So um, as I mentioned, that, that grass crop, uh, I wanted to point out that 
um, here in the state of Nevada, the, the cheat grass um, is along roadsides in along dirt roads. Um, that is not something that we can generally maintain like we can along the highways. So that grass crop is going to um, play a role there. And, and that's different here in Nevada, right? You know, so some other states might not have that cheat grass. They might be dealing with pine needles. So the um, component that we have here is a little bit different. The cheatgrass can combust at about 520-ish degrees. So with the combination of uh, the cheatgrass that we have and the frequent winds that we receive here in Nevada, it is a recipe for um, an ignition source to become a wildfire. <clears throat> which is the saying that we have a lot in prevention is one less spark is one less wildfire. So we like to work together on uh, reducing those chances of a human caused fire. Oops, we're going backwards here. There we go. So Brad went a little bit over um, ways that a vehicle can start a fire. Um, so I just wanted to share this graphic because I thought um, I'm a visual person and so we're gonna start here with the exhaust pipes. Um, so if, if there's an exhaust pipe, there must be a spark arrestor on that um, or else they can shoot out hot particles. So do not drive on or park on tall grass. Um, it's required to have a spark arrestor on public lands. Chainsaws are also required to have a spark arrestor. In fact, if we are in fire restrictions on the humble Toyabi lands, you are not allowed to operate a chainsaw after one o'clock if we have fire restrictions in place. Um, also, don't forget to regularly clean uh, your spark arrestor after uh, hours and hours of riding. Uh, trapped carbon particles can build up in your spark arrestor, so it will need to be cleaned um, out of your, your bike. Um, to improve the performance of your bike as well, but to also prevent hot carbon particles to be thrown into uh, the land and land in a, a fertile fuel bed where it can start a wildfire. So also the, the tire pressure, um, an underinflated tire can cause the rim to hit the road or rock and create a spark or cause a blowout. Um, I've even seen rivets in the asphalt on, on a highway from that happening. Uh, the dragging chains. Um, I've investigated many of these fires. Again, I can see a little rivet in the road that indicates um, something hitting the asphalt there. So I've also been driving behind a vehicle. Maybe some of you guys have too, where you can see those sparks being thrown from a dragging chain hitting the road. <clears throat> We also have um, the hot engine uh, or the, the undercarriage of a vehicle can get hot. And again, with our cheat grass, it's, it's very likely that that engine can um, start a fire. So also the brakes here on, on this is when the brake pads get worn too thin, um, it can cause a metal to metal friction and that can also throw sparks. So maintenance of your vehicle is very important. You know, those brakes, um, the, the tune-ups that you get to create um, a clean running engine. So catalytic converters, I, I've also seen um, a diesel truck um, capable of shooting hot particles. It was about 40, almost 50 feet off of the highway. So that was a pretty good distance. I uh, didn't realize that it could throw it that far. So those carbon particles were actually found 50-ish feet off of the roadside. Um, so maintenance of your vehicles, again, very, very important. Let's go to the next slide here. I'm talking about target shooting now. So, so this is specific to forest lands. Both state and federal laws also apply on forest lands. So you'll need to uh, check on the state laws and ordinances there and which, um, which will apply to, to forest service lands and where you're visiting. 
Um, they also need to be in compliance with our general federal laws and regulations um, about weapons. And then we, you know, say it's just, it's not safe to shoot when it's dry, hot, windy. Um, we don't advise that. Um, you don't wanna be that, that person. Um, don't, don't shoot into rocks or metal objects and also place your targets in areas that are free of vegetation. Um, bullet fragments can heat up to 1400 degrees. And so when I was talking about that cheat grass being um, combustible at about 520 degrees, those bullet fragments are heating up to 1400 degrees. Um, I've even, um, some research says that those, uh, the cheatgrass can even combust at about 430. So, you know, we're looking at a pretty low temperature and those bullet fragments can heat up to a pretty high temperature. Um, and then depending upon the fuel that it lands in and the weather conditions, um, you know, be very cautious of that. Um, so clear that vegetation around your target shooting area, have a fire extinguisher available and a shovel. I also like to recommend, tar recommend target shooters to bring a um, tarp or a sheet to lay down so it can catch all the shells and it just makes for an easy cleanup. Um, and it may also be an indicator of a bullet fragment being hot by leaving um, a mark there. So I, I do recommend that. Um, and, you know, and in my um, experience of investigating target shooting related fires, um, it's not only that scientific methodology that Brad was speaking to that has proved that, that those bullets have started fires. Um, I have also had the shooters call 911 and stay on scene. Um, these responsible shooters um, showed me videos of them shooting and the fire starting. So not only is my scientific methodology saying that this is where it started, the shooters were the ones that said, I could not believe that that happened. I never thought that would happen to me. Um, and I see it in the videos. It's difficult to run a um, hundred yards um, uphill with a shovel and a fire extinguisher. So, um, you know, choose to not shoot on those dry, hot, windy days. This is a picture of a fire that I have investigated um, in the Reno area um, a handful of years ago. And so I just wanted to share the example of how close this wildland urban interface is. So had the wind have been going in a different direction that day, um, it, it wouldn't have been good. Um, this is a illegal shooting area. And the reason why it's an illegal shooting area is because it is too close to the houses. Um, they should have been at least a mile out that day. Um, so just a, a good example of um, an illegal shooting area there. Okay. so. So campfires, I mentioned that um, a little bit earlier, um, that that was a, a bigger problem for us last year. Um, so hopefully with the education of people being aware that um, that can happen and what to do um, before you even have a campfire. Um, so before you have a campfire, know if you can have one. Um, and a good way of finding out if you can have one is nevadafireinfo.org. Uh, we load everything on there from um, BLM, NDF, and um, the Forest Service. So if we go into fire restrictions, you will be able to find out if we are fire restrictions on that page. Um, so it is the land recreator's responsibility to find out if we are in fire restrictions for the area that they wish to camp in. Um, so you also would be checking signboards. Um, you can follow us on social media. Um, and then if you do find out that you can have a campfire, then keep it small and clear the area around the campfire. We recommend five feet of clearance around your campfire. So bring um, a tool to help you make that happen. Um, if you are in California, because the humble Toyabe lands, uh, we also have land in California, uh, we require a California campfire permit, which um, is free and can be found online or at a ranger station. Um, 
Another thing, if you didn't bring uh, enough water to extinguish your campfire and there isn't water available, if you are not camping um, in a developed area, let's say, um, then don't have a fire. If you did not bring enough water to put out your campfire, don't have one. Um, it's your responsibility to extinguish that fire um, by drowning it, stirring it, and, and feeling it. Um, also, if we are in fire restrictions or you just wish to not go home smelling like smoke, um, there's many of uh, campfire alternatives out there that you can find. Um, I like to do that and it's kind of fun. I, actually, I like it a lot. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, next slide here. I think they polled you guys uh, to ask if you knew what red flag warnings were. Sounds like uh, the report was the majority of you did, which is good. So I won't spend too much time here, but um, a red flag warning will be in effect um, when it's critical fire weather conditions. Um, and uh, it usually means those strong winds, dry fuels, low humidity, dry lightning um, that can create those critical fire weather um, situations. Um, if a red, red flag warning is in effect, um, all firewood is prohibited, uh, uh, all firewood cutting, I'm sorry, is prohibited until the warning is lifted. Um, these are the days that you should choose to, to not do any activity that could create a spark. Um, again, it's your responsibility to find out if the area that you're in is in a red flag warning. Um, we, you can find that, I put a little link there. That's how I research that and find out if we are in a red flag warning. Okay, I wanted to mention that May is Wildfire Preparedness Month and Awareness Month for, for wildfires. So we actually, we have a annual fire prevention team for the last six years amongst uh, federal partners and state partners and Living With Fire. Um, to, to saturate the state of Nevada with fire prevention information. So these are information, um, informational graphics, infographics, and banners that we have spread across the state. Uh, so you will see these all over the place. We have gone to um, all as many retail shops and camping stores and gun shops and um, any kind of stakeholder that we, we can find to partner with us to help spread this message about um, preventing wildfires. So you'll see um, these banners hung at all kinds of fire stations, um, camping stores, and then just informational handouts along with different social media graphics to try and get that message out and just um, as many tips as we can possibly provide. Um, <clears throat> and more of these types of graphics can also be found on Nevada Fire Info. That is the website that I recommended for the restrictions page. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for all things fire in Nevada. And then lastly, I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that these fire prevention tips and regulations are in place to keep you um, and our community and our firefighters safe. So please do your part in preventing human caused fires. Um, and Megan, that's, that's all I got. Awesome, thanks Jen. I want to go, I want to reiterate just the, how the usefulness of that Nevada fire info Org. It, I, I go there all the time. There's a link to a fire map. So if during while, like when wildfires are happening, if you guys are curious about where they are, if you guys need information from your fire agencies, that is definitely a great place to start. And um, it is a one-stop shop, like Jen said. So save that link. I put it in the chat and bookmark it. <laughs> You'll probably use it a lot during fire season. I wanted to get the Q&A started. Um, someone dropped a question in the chat. Um, and I also just wanted to check quickly with Christina. Christina, did anybody send you any questions? No, I didn't get any questions. Okay. 
So Alice uh, Cantalo asked, she asked if there's any specific issues with electric cars. So I'll, I'll give this to either Brad or Jen, whoever has a good answer. Um, it says brake and low tire pressure could still be an issue, but the underside doesn't get very hot. So do you guys know anything about electric cars? And then Alice also, because we, we have a small group, if you guys wanna uh, turn your mic on, turn your camera on to follow up, feel free. So Brad or Jen, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so with the electric cars, I mean, they're not gonna have uh, an exhaust system um, because they don't have an internal combustion engine. Um, so as far as the catalytic converter, um, the exhaust particles, um, that would be taken out of play. And that's quite a bit of what causes the roadside fires here. Um, but you're right, um, brakes would still be the same. Um, pulleys or parts flying off of the vehicle would still be a problem. Um, and I haven't seen, I don't know about the undercarriage being too hot. Uh, I haven't seen too many um, electric cars going off road or um, even pulling off to the side of the road uh, to see if that's a problem. But it might, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, go for it. Sorry, the only thing I would add there is that, um, and I have not investigated a fire related to an electric car, but um, I have seen the extension to Wildland based on um, the, the batteries catching fire. Um, so those are fueled by like the chemicals and the heat buildup and like the lithium type battery systems. So I do, I have heard of those um, having failure and um, causing extension into the Wildland, although I haven't investigated one. Yeah, they, um, they catch fire a lot faster than um, regular vehicles too. They, the battery just explodes. Do you guys count um, those train fires as human caused, just out of curiosity, Brad? The trains? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah, anything that um, was made by a man that would cause a fire would be. And, and yes, if, for example, in that train video, when you have that train going along and a, particles are blowing out, um, we would count every single one of those fires as a separate fire. So mm -hmm. in a lot of these cases too, um, when, you, when you have five starts from the same vehicle, we count those as five separate fires. So those wouldn't be one occurrence. Uh, we count those as five. And then can you remind us how many fires in Nevada are human caused? I know I, I, I've heard anywhere between like 40 to 60. Uh, 40 to 60 human caused fires for the whole state? Or just the percentage of human caused? Like how many, what's the percentage of fires that are caused by these types of ignitions that you guys were talking about? And again, this would be um, different all over the state. Uh, Reno and Vegas would have a higher number of human caused fires than rural Nevada. Um, Winnemucca, we usually get about 40 human caused fires uh, a year and about 60 lightning fires a year. So you're looking at still a high number, um, almost 70% of human cause fires um, versus lightning. But again, in the higher population areas, you're going to have a lot higher numbers of human cause fires versus lightning. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to keep asking you guys questions, but um, in the meantime, I'm going to also launch our second poll or post workshop poll. So folks can, I want to make sure we give people an opportunity to answer that. Um, okay, so the, you guys mentioned that your prevention messages, messaging kind of follows trends that you see. Um, is there anything else you want to highlight besides, like, are there, I guess what I'm asking is, has, what are the trends that you're looking at right now? Um, I know you mentioned target shooting, but it seems like there's a lot of people getting out outside maybe for the first time, especially because of COVID. Is that anything that you guys have noticed, Jen or Brad? Are there a lot of sort of newbies to camping and out, being outdoors? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we're just kicking off fire season right now. Things are starting to dry out, you know, um, so I can speak a little bit more to last year and uh, the recreation did increase so much last year with people going outdoors. So our abandoned campfires and illegal campfires and escape campfires, those all went up last year based on the amount of recreators that we were seeing. Um, Prior to that, and I'm speaking to at least the Humble Toyabi lands right now, um, prior to that, we saw a lot of target shooting um, in, in previous years to that. But I think I, I want to say that our prevention efforts and educating people that that can, that can cause a wildfire, that um, people are being more cautious. So I'm hoping that we see that number go down in the future. Um, you know, lightning is, is is a big cause in Nevada. Um, we typically do see more lightning than we do human caused fires, at least on the humble Toyabi lands. However, this year, um, you know, after being in a couple of years of droughts, we're looking at the higher countries and elevations being much more drier this year um, than we have seen in the last couple of years. So I think that those numbers are going to vary um, year to year based on uh, what what the conditions are. And then also, you know, around 4th of July, we see more firework related fires. Um, you know, during boating season, when people are, are dragging those chains places, we see more of that. Um, so I feel like it kind of does fluctuate a little bit based on uh, what kinds of activities people are doing and during what month. And I just had a question about those, those alternatives to campfires um, because I have never, I've never used those. So I'm not totally, I don't know what's available, but last year I do know that all of the forest land, you know, forest service lands and BLM lands were under fire restriction for a really long time, meaning that campfires were prohibited. So do you have any, can you just kind of uh, briefly go over what the, some of those alternatives are. You don't need to endorse any particular product, but just to let people know that if they do want to, I don't know, have that traditional campfire without creating such a wildfire risk. Yeah, I can take this. Um, so we, uh, if we have, if we are in restrictions, we stage one at least, we do still allow a propane um, type alternative. So if it has an on and an off switch, um, so it still has that type of um, ambiance, right? So you can um, have a portable type fire pit with an on and off switch. So we saw a little um, more of those last year. And then I personally, I have um, these torches that are, are solar. And so no batteries needed. I never have to do anything with them. I put it in the ground and it has like a pretend type fire feel. And really that's sometimes all I need to just, you know, put the, the chairs around it and, and be able to yeah, play the right. guitar and chat, you know? So um, I like the solar ones myself, but um, they do have those portable uh, propane campfire pits that I've seen too. Awesome. Yeah. I was, you mentioned that and I was just like, yes, what would, the campfire is such an, it's such an important part of the experience. Um, I think that those are all the questions I had. So if anybody else has any questions, um, feel free to hop on. Otherwise, I wanted to remind you guys that we have some more workshops coming up as part of this Living With Fire virtual series. I'm going to drop the link to sign up for those in the chat. Um, I think that's it for the month. Yeah, that is it for the month of May. So our next, the next workshop will begin in June. And that one is going to be about weather. So it's going to, we're going to, we're going to be talking with Dr. Tim Brown. He's a research professor and of climatology and director of the Western Regional Climate Center. And he's going to talk about climate and fire weather. We've touched on that a little bit today with the red flag warnings. But as we all know, our you know weather and climate are changing. The patterns are a little different. So it's a great time to kind of get reacquainted with, with the weather in the area. So if no one has any questions, we can end the meeting a little bit early. Um, does any, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't filled out the poll, please do that before you leave. 
I'm gonna stick around though until everyone leaves though, just in case we have any questions. Brad and Jen, I just wanted to thank you guys. Those are great presentations. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks all the participants for uh, logging in. Um, are, 